Uh, we've been doing uh, for the last few weeks a, uh, a series, football themed series, where um, uh, it's been pretty exciting. We're calling it Moving the Chains. And the goal is, you know, the idea of the series is the different things in our lives that we kind of move forward and we want to move forward in. And, and sometimes it feels like it's grinding and it's grueling, just like a football, football game. But uh, we just believe God has more for us and more, more to grow with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and really pray real quick here before we get started. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, first of all, God, we invite you into this place here today. And, and I believe, Lord, that you have something to say to each and every one of us here today. God, I pray, Lord, that you open each one of our hearts today to hear from you, whether it's from the stage here today or even from a conversation that somebody has uh, here today at this church, Father. I just pray that you bless us, Lord, your Holy Spirit is here, and uh, we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, I tell you, when we were planning this series, I was super excited because I really am. Like Jeremy, I mean, he's, he loves sports, but he's, he's a baseball guy when it comes down to it. You guys know, here plenty of baseball references over the year. Now, I am actually a football, game, I, a football guy. I love football. So I was super, super excited and, and, and obviously fact-checking Jeremy as he's talking about football every, each and every week. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have been too. So I was super excited uh, about this series. And, and here's the thing. If you're not a football fan, I, I, hear, I hear certain people talk about the game of football in a little different ways. If you're not a football fan, all you probably see is a bunch of uh, big, tall, tough guys that probably aren't that smart that, you know, all they do is take this oddly shaped ball and they're just trying to work it down a field and just hurting each other and doing all these things. Well, here's the truth. That is the truth. That's really what they're doing. But uh, there is also a little bit more that's going on that's so unique to football that no other sport has. Uh, you know, I love basketball is my other, other passion. I love basketball, uh, baseball, hockey, uh, even, um, you know, soccer, you know, European football, for those in here that want to say that right. Uh, those type of sports, they're, they're fast. They're kind of on the fly. There, there are plays and there are strategies that are put in place. But, you know, there, there's allowed for the player to have a lot of freedom within it. Now, football is just a little bit different. There's actually much more thought behind the game of football that if, you, if you're not a fan, you, you would actually never know. On average of uh, an NFL, a National Football League team, there is about 15 to 25 coaches on each team. You probably didn't know that. Uh, there is so much strategy, there is so much thought, and there's so much study that's put into each and every week that these coaches do. They say the average head coach in the NFL uh, uh, works about 18 hours a day, seven days a week. Like, he literally sleeps at his office. It was like one of the most stressful jobs that a uh, person can have. And, uh, they just, and the reason why they, they just need some of these, so much of this hours and time is that they, they spend so much time studying film of the other team, or studying film of their own team, and working with these guys. And, and literally, each player gets, uh, at the beginning of every year, a playbook. And they're like, usually like this thick. I mean, these things are big. And they have to study this thing, and they know it all the way through. So it's not just you know, bashing into each other. They have to know these plays. And the coaches work so hard to know about all these things because when game day comes, when, when it's time to play, they know, they see the defense uh, line up in a certain formation. Well, they know, okay, they're going to be running this play, so we need to run this play to beat the defense. Or they know when, um, you know, if they, the, their receiver is uh, working against another one of the defenders, that he's a little weak. They say, if we can run a play where that receiver cuts left really fast, then he's going to beat that guy. And that comes from homework, and that comes from studying day after day and learning about the game. And, but here's the thing. So all that can happen. All that's happening. And the coaches will call the plays out into the field. They'll call the plays to the quarterback who runs the plays. He tell you, hey, we're going to run it, or we're going to throw it, or we're, whatever we're going to do. But here's the thing. There's a little thing that not everybody might know, unless you're a football fan, but there's, the quarterback has the ability to call an audible. You may have never heard of that term before. What an audible is, is when the coach calls in a play, hey, we're going to run this play, and the uh, quarterback looks at the defense and says, yeah, I don't think that's going to work. And so what the quarterback does, he calls an audible. He calls a different play. He tells the other guys, hey, line up different. We're going to go a different route, guys. So all that homework, all that study, all that film, and everything the coaches did, the quarterback in an instant just throws that out. He said, okay, I've seen the moment, and I'm going to run with it. Well, after all that, I just, you know, that talk, a little update, learn, learn a little something about football today, right? You can go home, can't say you didn't learn nothing. Um, now when you hear an audible, you know what that is. Um, what does that relate to, to life? What, what, is, what does football have to do with life? And I think actually a lot, this analogy is, is, is very helpful. So if we want to look at our real life, our, our life as is, um, you look at God. Well, who is God? God is 
ultimately, he's the coach, right? He's the guy. He's studied our film of our lives. He's, he knows the defense like no other. He knows the things that are going to come against us. He knows the plans that he has for us. He has a game plan. He has a playbook for each and every one of us. He's writing our story. He's, he's got a plan. But sometimes we call some audibles, right? And, and my question is today is like we say uh, we trust God with some things, but do we actually trust him with everything? How many times do we call audibles in our life? And, and, and I'm just going to say this real quick. It's, it's not easy to do it. And I understand our society doesn't help build trust into our lives. It's not really kind of ingrained in our lives because, I mean, think about it. You, just turn on a TV, watch a commercial, an infomercial, right? How many times you turn on and you see, like, you take this pill in 10 minutes, you'll lose like 30 pounds, right? Can't believe that. Or you're like, you know, ladies, you'll understand this one. Like, how many lotions out there will make you wrinkle free? Then you go, and you, like, honestly, can I go to your house and see like 30 bottles of lotion? You know, they just, they just don't work. They don't do exactly what we expect to be. Or here's even a better one. Like, uh, how, how's it every time somebody comes up to you and says, hey, have I got an opportunity for you? And why is every time that happens, it takes money out of my pocket and puts it into yours, right? I can't trust that. At, at one time, I was 20 years old, and I was young, naive, and, and uh, I had a buddy of mine that I worked with, that he said, hey, man, you can go to this meeting here. Well, you know, this way you make a lot of money. And I'm sitting through this class, I'm seeing all these guys. At the time, I was 20, so 30 dudes were old, but I'm 35 now, so I guess I'm old. But uh, so I'm working on all these old dudes sitting around, they're like, yeah, taking notes. And like, hey, if you get somebody to buy into this thing, and then you get somebody to buy into that, and then you become a millionaire, I'm like, doesn't make sense to me, but so I started walking. Of course, there's a pyramid scam, scam there, right? And I walked around and asked the guys, like, hey, are you making money? How long have you been doing this? Like, two years? You rich yet? No, but I'm getting there. Like, yeah, I, that's not happening, man. I can't trust that. Can't trust that. Or famous last words. Now, you guys will know this one. It, it's, it's like the, you know, I'll be back. That's a famous last word, right? They're never come back. Well, how about I will never leave you? It's another famous last word. I swear every time I've heard that that person gets a job in another state and they're gone the next day, right? We just, just our life, you know, our society, what we run into, especially with humans, is we just can't completely trust. There's just, we can trust so far, but we can't trust completely because we have to keep this little room of antitrust so that we don't feel like we're broken or we don't feel like, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, a horrible person or we made a mistake. If we can just trust just a little bit, just a little bit, because there's a good chance that this person or this thing will disappoint me. And I think that just kind of relays over to God. And with God, he doesn't want us to just to trust him with some things. He wants, to try to trust, wants us to trust him with everything. If you're taking notes today, you probably want to write that down. That, that could change your life. God doesn't want us to just trust us with some things. He wants us to trust, uh, wants us to trust him with everything. And I'm not talking about just little bits and pieces or, or the little things in life. But, uh, you know, we say, those of us that are believers here today, and you believe in Jesus, and you say, hey, God, I trust you. I trust you in the whole heaven hell thing. I trust that you're the Son of God and that you died on the cross and you rose again. And we say these things, and we believe, and that's, that ultimately that is what we need to do. But honestly, do we trust him with everything? Well, trust him with that. But parents... Do we trust him with our kids? Do we sometimes hold a little too tight? Or we get a little worried that, you know, if we let our child go out in the world, that you know, something might happen. So we're going to hold them a little tight. They don't believe that God can do things in their life. Or let's talk about money for a second. We won't sit there long. I understand it's uncomfortable. But do we trust God with our money? Um, recently, I was talking with a, with a friend of mine that was pretty, pretty low out, you know, like bottom of the barrel with money. I mean, just rough. And he was working, he's working hard. He's trying to make money for his family. He's trying to, to support them. And he was like in, in some serious doubt that week. He, we, we, had, we had lunch and, and we, he was in some serious doubt. And he's like, I've been praying and I just don't know. I'm trying to believe. I'm trying to trust. But I just don't know right now. And then I, and I, just, I gave him a word of encouragement and just trying to encourage him. And we prayed right there. And we prayed. And guess what? That same week, you know, he got that job that he would have been holding out for. And God moved in his life. And it was like at that moment, he almost threw an audible there. Almost threw an audible and says, okay, I don't know about this. Maybe I need to go jump on this other job. Or, or maybe I just need to go work, in, you know, fast food or something just to make ends meet. But I just know, God, I'm praying for this specific job. And I'm praying for this moment. It, he did trust God with it. But it's like, how many times do we do that? We just sit back and we say, you know, it's tight right now. Maybe I need to make a jump, make a jump real quick. I can't, you know, I can't trust God for what he's promised in my life. 
maybe you're single here today and, and um, you know, and you, you believe that God has a spouse, so somebody that's amazing, that's perfect for you, that he has a plan for your life, and you're going to bring this person in. And how many times have we uh, met somebody, and, you know, we went on a first date, and you, you pretty much knew after the first date, yeah, this is not the person I'm going to marry, but so daggone cute. And yeah, they look so good. <laughs> you know, I, I got I to gotta keep this up. I got to keep going, you know. And like, I know it's not going to last, but, you know, when, God, while, you know, while you're waiting, I'm going to throw this audible in here. We'll, we'll date this person, this guy or this girl for a little while. And, and uh, you know, the, the one's coming, right? The one's coming. And then, I mean, sometimes that's just kind of dangerous. And think about it, what, what could happen with that? We, we jump into those situations, and when God's got some perfect plan, we throw this audible in, and, you know, and the next you know, you have some sort of emotional baggage that you're bringing into that relationship that God did have a plan for you. You just waited just a little bit, and so you just listened to what God was saying. This is not the right person. And said, okay, I, I'm going to wait for your perfect plan, God. I'm not going to throw that audible in there. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not easy trusting God. I, I, I personally know that extremely well, especially right now. And if I've ever preached a message on this stage, this one, if it's not me reaching you, it is, it is reaching me today. I've been wrestling with this over and over for the last few months. As you guys know, we mentioned earlier that we're um, um, moving into a new facility. And guys, hey, this is the la- second to last week here. It's pretty amazing. Next week is, this is it. It's moving day. We're moving out here. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Well, a lot of hard work has come for this place. We're moving, if you're new here today, we're moving to our own first permanent facility about one mile from here. Uh, so we're not leaving the neighborhood. If you like us, you can come check us out. We're not far. Um, but since, like, I think 4th of July weekend, uh, a few of us have been working pretty much every day. I spent about 90 to 95% of my time working on this building for the last three months. And let me tell you something, I am not good with a hammer. I, no, <laughs> I worked in healthcare for 15 years. I know people, and I don't know nothing about no drywall. Do y'all know there's like 15, 16 different kinds of saws? Like, I learned that. Like, what in the world? I don't know nothing about no saws. Just like, give me a saw. Like, I need to do this tool, but you don't have the right saw. I don't have the right saw. There's a saw right there. Like, I don't get it. Anyways, so the last, this last, uh, you know, summer, man, I, I've been working completely like a fish out of water. And I've learned a lot of things. Learned about drywall. and learned about painting. And I learned about all these things. And, uh, and, and part of me it has enjoyed that. But there's a huge part of me like, no, I am ready to work with people again. That's, that's so what I want to do. What's, that's so what God's put on my heart to do. But, but I believe, just along with the staff and, and several of you others, that this building was a plan from God, that God gave this to us, and, and that we, all the hard work that's put into it is going to go towards future lives, and we'll be able to do more in this community. We'll be able to do more in our lives, to be able to do more to bring the hope of Jesus to people. Now, I believe all that, and I say, God, I trust you in all that, but here lately, I'm just going to be just flat out honest. The last few weeks, man, I've wanted to give up. I mean, it's been like, no, I just can't do this. Literally, what is it, two weeks ago, I got an email from our financial people that says, stop buying stuff for the building. We don't have any money. And I'm like, what? I, but I'm on my way to Lowe's. Like, like I, I got to get some rope for the parking lot, or I got to get some paint to finish those walls. What, what do you mean? No, that's, that's, that's not possible. Like, all this hard work, you know, we can't stop now. And I started thinking, getting worried, I'm like, Man, I'm, I'm letting you guys down as a leader. I'm letting all these things, and all these things start coming to my head. I start getting stre- you know, stressed and struggling, and, and I started just you know, working at a pace that was just unreal. And all these things start happening. I start feeling like, why is this even a problem? And then guess what? God says, you know, it, it's still cool. I got this. I got this, man. And it was like, uh, I mentioned that email, and then like three days later, like $10,000 just came in. Like seriously. It was like, what? God, that's awesome. We still need more, by the way. Just throw that out there. <laughs> if you want to give, go, you know, go online. Anyways, but, uh, um, but I do believe now, now that I know God has got a plan. And what, what, I, what I learned through this situation here, I just want to share with you guys today. During this time where I've been stressed and I've been struggling and it's been hard for me. And what I learned is what was happening in my life that there was some things in my life that I wasn't trusting God with. And I really, really believe if I could be a betting person today. If you're here today and life just seems just a little extra hard or there's a little bit of a struggle or there's something that's just not right, I'm, I bet to believe that there's something in your life that you're not completely trusting God with. Because when we trust God, he's got the plan. He takes all that from us. And if we follow his plan, there's no reason to stress. There's no reason to struggle. There may, things may be hard, but we know he's got it. And that's what I want to talk about today. And I believe there's, 
there's three things that I went through, and I, and I think that it can relate to everybody today, that, that uh, we have, a, have in our lives that help us struggle with trusting God completely with everything. And uh, the first one, if you're taking notes today, is uh, the pace of our lives. And there's this amazing story uh, that I read uh, just last week um, about you know, two guys not trusting Jesus and kind of the outcome of that. And it's an amazing story, and we're going to read through that today. Um, but kind of give you a little context before we get there. Um, so we're, we're literally, this story takes place on Easter Sunday. Like, it's the day that Jesus rose from the dead, that he, came, he rose from the tomb, he defeated death, and, you know, we, all our paved, uh, sins have been paid for, and we can go to him. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing day. Epic day in history. The best day in history. And this story leads us up to where Jesus, he was here on earth. He, he, his ministry lasted about three years. He, he started about age 30, and, he, and he, he was crucified and resurrected about age 33. So during this time, he went through, he was preaching. He was teaching people about love. He was teaching about trusting God and, and all these great things. And he was creating like a great big following. And sometimes the Bible would say, you know, thousands of people would listen to him speak. He was healing the sick. He was loving on people. This is what Jesus' ministry was about. And then about when he got 33, during the time when the uh, religious leaders at the time did not like what he had to say. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. So they basically framed him and had him had Rome crucify him. And so this story we're catching up, uh, on Easter Sunday, uh, this is three days, Jesus has said, hey, I, uh, my temple, the temple will be destroyed and it will be rebuilt in three days. He was trying to tell his disciples, he was trying to tell his followers, guys, I'm coming back. This has to happen. All these prophecies that have happened for over the years, I've got to fulfill them to, to you know, bring, you know, bring sin down in this world and make a pathway to God. And he's just telling them all these things. And then, uh, so all the disciples hear all this, and on the crucifixion, all of them disappeared. They ran in fear. They didn't trust the plan. They left. And on the third day, the, there's a story of these two women. We're catching up to the story we're going to read. There's two women that went down to the tomb, and they went to go like, uh, take care of Jesus' body and to make sure he was okay, to, to probably mourn, to grieve uh, Jesus being gone. And when they got there, they found the tomb had rolled away. It was gone. There's no, no Jesus. There's no, no Jesus in the tomb. And, you know, an angel comes to them and says, he is not here. And they run back and they tell the disciples. And they're all like, no, what are you talking about? And, you know, and Peter, one of the head disciples, he runs down there. He sees the tomb is empty. And he comes back and tells the other disciples, the tomb is empty, guys. They weren't lying. And so this is where we're picking up our story. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 13, it says, The same day, two of Jesus' followers, some, some translations say, uh, put disciples, were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. All right, so just told you what had happened. They just found out that the tomb was empty. They just found out that he, he wasn't there. Maybe all, some of those things he said, you know, the same guy they watched do all these miracles, like walk on water and turn water into wine and uh, do all these amazing things, heal sick people. And they still didn't believe the plan that God had had. They called an audible, like, we're out of here, man. We're off to Emmaus. The party's in Jerusalem, but they're going someplace else. They left the party early, getting out of Dodge. They're moving away. They didn't trust the plan. They, call, they called an audible, and they drifted away. And, and I just... How many times have, have we, in some ways, done that as well? Where the plan was there, and I was talking about myself earlier, you know, and I started to think, I need to go this way. I need to go to Emmaus because I'm going to do my own thing, and I'm going to try to fix this plan that seems to be broken. And in turn, I'm actually walking away from the very thing that's going to change my life and save me. And I, see that's, I think that's what these two guys are doing. And when I talk about drifting, when I say that, I'm talking about that you know about Jesus, you don't know Jesus. And because you don't know Jesus, you don't trust his plan. You don't trust that, hey, he's going to come back and move forward. Um, let me keep reading here uh, in the next verse here in 14. It says, as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. Pretty cool story, right? So here we go, the two disciples, two followers, whichever you want to say, two guys that knew Jesus, that had you know, meals with him, that had seen him preach millions of times and you know, spent time with him. All of a sudden, Jesus shows up. Jesus just rose from the dead, man. Who, where did he go? He went to the two guys who was walking away, two guys that left. Now, ten, uh, 
when I was 20 years old, I, uh, I, left, I grew up in church, and I left church because of, uh, I wasn't happy with things. I wasn't happy with the plan. And I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, church is not going to save your life. Jesus changes your life. But God does bring the church to this world so that we can be loved on and cared for and guided and directed in our lives. And God can use the church to help assist us make a difference. That's why I love this church. And we, we, we say we want people to embrace the story they're meant to live. We want to help you do that. And that's what the church is for. So don't get me wrong. I, I've left the church. I should have found another one if I wasn't happy. I should have done something different. But I called an audible. I said, all right, God, I, I believe in you. I believe in you. But I'm just going to kind of do my own thing for a while. Then slowly, the more audibles I called, the more farther I away, got away. I got to the point where I actually didn't even believe in him. And what I thought was an, you know, an innocent audible, like I'm just going to change the plan just a little bit. I'm the quarterback. I see the play. I, I'm just going to call an audible on this play. I'll do your plan next time. Well, then he saw, wait a minute, that, i got to fix what I just did. So let me call another audible. Right? Oh, yeah, it's messed up. i gotta, I got to do it again. i got to get things right. And so after a while, we start to drift away. We start to get away from the plan that God has. We get away from the game plan we, to the point where he's not even the coach anymore. We say, God, I don't mind being on your team, but I'm not going to follow your plays, right? And um, so we see here these two guys, they're walking, and Jesus shows up. And that's the cool thing. Every time we walk away, Jesus comes to find us, right? It's pretty amazing. These two guys, they, 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 Jesus just rose to the dead, and then now he is following after them. But the cool part here is, and it says in 16, it says, but they kept them from recognizing him. I don't know what, you know, I don't know, it doesn't describe what that was. Did Jesus have a hood on? Did he have a mask? You know, was it some sort of miracle? He looked like somebody else, you know, and they didn't recognize him. I, we don't know. But I... I actually kind of think that there was something a little bit more. And I believe the real reason they didn't recognize him was because of the pace of their life was not going the right way. That they were so busy in intent of getting out of Jerusalem because that's where their Messiah was crucified. That's where all the bad things had happened, where it got hard, and they ran away. They were too busy trying to get to their next destination, that they were too busy to see Jesus. And when Jesus comes, comes to talk to them, he almost becomes more of an interruption than an assistance, because they're too busy focused on the next thing. Now about you, I, I, my mom doesn't live in, in here. I don't live close to my mom. So you know how it is when you, you get moms and they want to call you and they ask me, are you eating enough? You, you know, you, you getting enough sleep? Or how are you doing, right? And I've noticed the last few months when she say, how are you doing? And I'll say, busy. That's all I say. And I, and I realized I kept saying that. I was like, well, why am I saying that? And I really think that subconsciously I'm saying, hey, I'm sorry that I don't have enough time for you. I know you want to have a relationship with me, but I, I'm just too busy to have that relationship. I'm too busy to get to know you, what's happening in your life, to, to even tell you what's happening in my life. And I really think that sometimes that we can get that way. We can just get so busy that when Jesus is trying to talk to us, he's trying to say, hey, come over here. This is where it's at, man. This is what the plan I have for you. We're like, no, no, we, we, I got to go. I got a meeting. I got a soccer game to go to. I've got, a, uh, I got an event to do. I don't have time. You don't understand my job, Jesus. It's so busy. Like, they can't do it without me. Let me give you a little secret today. And I know you're, you know, there's people who are like, ah, let me give you a little secret. We control our schedule. And, and here's a little trick. I learned this from Jeremy and Kimmy, actually, and our pastors. And they, uh, they, uh, they, if you take your phone, I mean, pull your phone out. It's got a calendar on it. And, you know, go ahead. Like, you see, all right, Thursday from 3.30 to 4.30, I've got nothing. When the rest time. There's your appointment for that day. There's that time. So when your boss comes, hey, what are you doing at 3.30? Got an appointment. Got something to do. Right? There you go. It's a Saturday. You know, and there's, there's a birthday party or there's something going on. But you've worked all week. Man, stay home with your family. Stop for a second. It, it's in, uh, we, this last series, we talked about the promised land. Uh, and that was uh, a, a series about Moses. And one of the weeks, we talked about the Ten Commandments. And out of the Ten Commandments, all, all those things, the one commandment, it says, honor the Sabbath. And the Sabbath means a day of rest. On that commandment, God talks about that commandment more than any of the other ones. He talks about rest. Genesis tells us that when he created the heavens and the earth, everything, he did it all in six days, and the seventh day he rested. Rest is important, not just to rest, because when we rest, we slow down, and we have time to hear Jesus. We have time to hear what he has to say. So I just want to encourage you guys today. And I know that's hard. And it's, and it's something that you got to work at. And I've had to work at. And there's times that, like, this is a busy season. It, it's okay. But find time in that busy season to rest. It's healthy. 
Because if we're not resting, we're not listening to Jesus, we're not hearing him, how can we trust him in his plan? And we keep calling audible and audible and audible, and then we get farther and farther away until it's hard to get back. So just evaluate our lives and, and see how we can truly appreciate that relationship Jesus wants to have with us. The second reason I think we, uh, we have trouble trusting Jesus with everything is our expectations in our lives. You ever been disappointed with something? You ever gone online and you ordered uh, something that looked awesome on there and you're like, oh, that's going to be great. And then when it comes in the mail, it's like the size of a keychain, you know, and you're like, what? You know, it's like a different shade of blue. You know, you're like, that's not what I expected. Like, no, that's not cool. Or you, or you go to a fancy restaurant. And when I mean fancy, I mean expensive, right? And you order like a, you order like a $40 steak and you're like, oh, this thing's going to be huge. Like, I'm going to tear it down. You get the bib out, everything, whatever. And, uh, and then it comes back and you're like, this big. You got like two bites and it's gone. You're like, no, no foul, man. Not cool. Take it back. You know, like we just get disappointed. And, and these two guys here, they run into the same situation in chapter 17 here. He says, he asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walked along? They stopped short, sat, uh, short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. It's kind of funny, like telling, me, telling Jesus about Jesus, right? And uh, the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who, who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and our religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. Get this. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened in three days. We had hoped. So here, we'll give a little context for these two guys. These are, you know, we learned in the beginning of the story, they're followers, they're disciples of Jesus. The, these guys spent time with him. They saw the miracles. They listened to him speak. They knew him better than pretty much most anybody They spent the most time with him. And at this moment, he somehow is not meeting their expectation. And to give a little context here, the, when the people of Israel at that time, when they, all these prophecies for hundreds of years, there was prophecies of a Messiah coming to Israel to save them. And during this time, Rome ruled the world. And Rome was not a very good ruler. I mean, they, they ruled with fear. You know, they, they, they killed people, they crucified people, they tortured them to get what they needed. And they came in, they took all their money, they taxed them, they did all these things, they conquered them. So it wasn't a very good time to be in the world unless you were a Roman. So the people of Israel thought, like, well, when the Messiah comes, he'll actually be a political leader. And so they expected Jesus to come and be a ruler, like raise up an army and literally... Uh, take over the world and sit on a throne. That's what they expected. That's what they thought when they interpreted the prophecies. But what ends up happening is Jesus comes, and he is the Messiah, and he comes, and he comes loving and healing people and, and caring for them and saying, hey, I actually have to become the least so you, you know, so we become greater. And he says, you know, he, he comes and he says, I have to die. I have to lay myself down so I can save you versus where they thought he was going to raise himself up and conquer the world. So their expectations were not met. They said, you know, this is, this is not the Messiah. He's now a, a prophet, you know, a good teacher. You know, all these things that he, they keep using this wordage where just then they said, we hoped he was the Messiah. How many times have we hoped the same thing in our lives where we take our preferences and turn them into his promises, but he actually never, ever promised it. Think about this, you know, you say, well, this is supposed to be my dream job. It don't feel so dreamy at the moment. But, God, I'm going to have to change. You know, I know you said this is where I'm supposed to be, but it just don't feel that way. And we call it audible and we get out of the situation because it just didn't meet the expectations. When God was saying, hey, if you just waited six more months, this guy was going to retire and you were going to get promoted and everything was going to work out. Or, like, you get the idea that you need to go to, uh, you know, quit your job to go to school, but you're like, no, I just... It just seems like it's just too hard. You know, and God's saying, hey, this is where I want to take you the path. So, like, it just doesn't meet the expectations because it's just too hard to do. So you go back to work and, you, and you, you don't finish school. You know, or, you know, things happen. We can't trust God because, you know, hey, mom or dad died. You know, like, hey, that's, that wasn't part of the plan, Jesus. I don't understand. But here's the thing. God's plan has to be greater than our plan. And in case you look, you're, maybe you're not getting all the football terms. Let me, let me kind of give it to you like this. You know, we, we love stories here at Story Church. You know, you probably have all heard the story of Cinderella. You know, was it uh, ugly, you know, stepmother and, and the stepsisters, and they, they won't let her go to the ball, and, you know, fairy godmother comes, and 
turns her into a princess and he's glass slippers and the, and the pumpkin and they, she goes off to the ball and, you know, she meets the prince and, you know, he finds her with a slipper and hap, lives happily ever after, right? Great story. Written by one author. One author wrote that story. And we all know that story. But what if, I think sometimes in our lives, we're, Jesus is trying to write the story of our lives. He's trying to write this, this story. And we keep jumping in. Now, now let, me, let me write a line here. Let me, let me write this here. And all of a sudden, the story don't look quite right because we keep jumping in and, and interrupting the author. So you look at, like, uh, the Cinderella story. So if, like, multiple people start writing, multiple popular authors come in, and it look like this is, say, Cinderella. She, she's, uh, you know, being picked on by her ugly stepmother and stepsisters, and all of a sudden, Peter Pan shows up with Santa Claus, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, Captain Hook, you know, hangs out with, Santa, you know, with Jack Frost. Whatever it is, you know, some, all of a sudden, these, like, other stories come in, and you're like, that could be kind of an interesting story, but, <laughs> but it's not a good story. It, it doesn't make sense. And if you really think about it, if God is reading the story of our lives, you're like, like, stop writing in there. I've got a plan. If you just hold on for a second, if you just trust me, I have something for you. Stop writing. If you read the stories of our lives, and all of a sudden it just tails off this way, and it makes no sense anymore. But it's because we just don't trust him, and we keep going further. We don't, he's not reaching our expectations. Things aren't happening like we thought they should. Here's the thing. His plan has to be greater than our plan. He's seen all the film. We're going back to football here. He's seen all the film. You know, he knows the end of the story. He's written it. And we just need to trust him to get us there. Uh, the third and final thing that we don't, you know, we learn don't trust God. And this, one's, this one might hit home a little bit, is we don't know Jesus well enough. And, um, and I get this from the scripture here. It says, uh, Verse 25, we'll jump to 25. It says, Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you will find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So here's Jesus. He's, he, these two followers, they've, they've decided to go their own way. They've called an audible. They've left the game. Jesus goes to find them, love Jesus, comes to find us when we walk away. And what does he do to bring them back? He tells them about his word. He tells them what was in here. He tells them what was written. He reminds them, hey, this was written. This is what, this was the game plan, guys. This is not what you expected, but this was the game plan. And he reminds them, hey, go back to here. And I'll tell you, I think, you know, I want to challenge you today. If, If Sunday mornings is the only time that you hear anything from the word, or anytime you hear anything from God, Missing out. Missing out on our relationship. We read this thing. We read about him. We get to know him. When we pray, we spend time with him. We get to know him. And when we know him, we can trust him. Can you trust somebody you don't know? No. It doesn't make sense. I mean, how many times you go into a car dealership and you're like, yeah, I can't trust this guy. I don't know him. But wouldn't you rather go to somebody that you knew worked there? It makes more sense, right? So do we know Jesus? I tell you, 15 minutes every day, morning, at lunchtime, at nighttime, down and you read and learn about him, I guarantee it will change your life. You'll find that you can trust him more because you read in here, like, hey, he says he's got a promise for me for this. Uh, what was it? Uh, Philippians um, 4.19 says, I will, I will supply all the needs of your riches through his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. That's a promise, right? That's a promise. And what, you know, we worry about money and we worry about these things in our lives. That's, it, you wouldn't know that if you didn't read that, if you didn't get to know him. So when you read the game plan, Read God's game plan. Get to know him. And you can trust him. Do we trust Jesus because we don't know him? Do we trust Jesus because the pace of our life is just not healthy? Do we trust Jesus because he's not meeting our expectations, which that never should have been the expectation in the first place? I don't know. But I do know these things can cause us to not trust him. Um, I'm going to ask the band come on out. They're ready. Um, I'm going to say this. Um, Read this last part here where it kind of closes out. Verse 28 says, By the time they were nearing Emmaus, and at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on. But they begged him, Stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. And I think he... um, uh, they noticed him because they slowed down to see him. I want you to think about this. It says, he broke the bread. That's when they knew him. Well, what happens when you break the bread? 
you reach over, you hold it. And this is Easter Sunday. You probably saw the nails in his hand, the holes in his hand. You're like, oh my goodness, Jesus, the plan was right. He's alive. I should have listened. Should why, why are we going the wrong way? Why did we leave? I think God today is trying to say, I'm walking with each and one, every one of you. And I'm just trying to tap you on the shoulder like, hey guys, I got this. Why is it so hard? It doesn't need to be so hard. I've got the answer. Come follow me. Let's go back to Jerusalem. And that's what they end up doing, actually. In 32, they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn us as we talked, as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within that hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. They figured it out. I said, there you go. Time to get back on the plan. Enough audibles. Time to go back home. Are we back home today? You know, are we in that spot? And I believe when we see Jesus clearly, we will see our path clearly. Here go back, a little football story here for you. 1989, the Super Bowl, it was uh, against the San Francisco 49ers and the uh, Cincinnati Bengals. This is the end of the game. This is the Super Bowl. This is, this is for everything. And the 49ers were down by, like, I think, three or four points. They needed a touchdown to win. There was three and a half minutes left in the game. Joe Montana, you probably have heard, if you don't know football, you probably have heard about this guy. He's one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. He comes into the huddle in this last drive. They have three minutes to get all the way down the field to score the final score, to win the game. If they don't do it, they lose, okay? It, all the pressure's on them. The whole season, everything they had done was for this moment. And here's the thing. This is so cool. This is, this is a true story, by the way. So Joe gets to go head to the huddle to give the, final, give the plays that the coach called in. And he looks up in the stands, and he notices this guy named John Candy. He's a, at the time, in the 80s, he was a very popular comedian. He was a celebrity. And, the, and he says to the, uh, his team, like, hey, did you guys see John Candy up there? What? This is the biggest moment. These guys are stressing out. We're like, we've got to score this touchdown. We've got to win the game. And you're looking at John Candy. Well, Joe, his nickname was Joe Cool, man. He, he, he knew the plan. He knew that the coaches had done the homework. He knew that they would win if they just followed the plan. But I think this happens when we know the plan and we follow Jesus and we see him clearly. You know what? We get to enjoy everything around us. We're not so struggling and stressed and narrow-minded towards this one goal and, and these one things that are just messing with us. We get to enjoy life. We get to enjoy the beauties of life and enjoy the great things. If, if life right now just doesn't seem like you're just narrowed in and things are struggling and they're just not doing so well, there's something in your life you need to talk to Jesus about and see what, what is wrong. Why can't I trust him in these situations? Why am I not part of the plan? Let's get back to Jesus. Let's see him clearly. And real quick, easy, just recap, you know, get, you know read about him, get to know him. Evaluate our lives. Is our pace unhealthy? I'm going to tell you, if the job is too much, man, I, I want, this was uh, several years ago, but this was actually before I started following Jesus, so it's not a big Jesus story, but I was uh, uh, working at a job, great job. You know, I worked uh, 14 hours, I was managing three urgent cares and, uh, in, in three different cities. I was all over the place. I was working 14 hour days, seven days a week. Even when I was off, they, they called me. You know, I, it, was, it was a very well paying job. And from a success standpoint, I had tons of it. You know, I was doing really, really well. But I had no time. I was working at an unbelievable pace. And then I just finally said, you know what? I want some other things in my life. I want to get married. I want to have a family. I want to do these things. And there's just no time for that. I have all this money, but I got no, place to, no time to spend it. You know, all these things. And I literally, I took a 10,000-year pay cut to go to another job. I would do it again in a heartbeat. It's worth it, guys. If, you, if you're in that situation and your pace is not healthy, you know, and, you, and you're not having time to spend with Jesus, and, you're, and, you're, and you feel like you're struggling, man, you know, it, it's, it's worth Jesus. Talk to him. Pray with him. Like, this is not working. How can I get back? And it may be a drastic change. It may be something that you never think you would do. I've heard lately, I've heard great stories of people, like, literally saying, all right, I'm doing this. I'm going to trust him, and I'm going to go back to school. Or I'm going to trust him and get this new job. Or I'm going to trust him in this money situation. And time after time, I'm seeing God do amazing things. It can happen to each and every one of us. So I just want to challenge each one of you. to Evaluate your lives and see if there's something there that you need to trust Jesus with. Let's go ahead and pray real quick. Lord Jesus, I, I, first of all, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Lord, I God, I ask you that uh, you come into our lives, Lord, and you, and you highlight the areas that, Lord, we kind of got off the plan, where we, 
where we got off uh, track, Father, where we called an audible and we got out of your plan. Show us that way, God, and, and allow us to slow down just enough so we can turn around and see you standing there, seeing you breaking that bread with us. And we sit down and have the intimate moment with you on a daily basis so you can show us the plan, so we can write this beautiful story that you're trying to write. Father, I pray for each and every person here, God, Lord, that you, you give them peace in these struggles. You give them help in the heartache. Father, Lord, you do be there for us, Father. I know you promised that. I just want to ask you, Lord, you do that for us, Father. I pray, Lord, as a church, God, Lord, as we, we go into this new season, this new chapter two in this new building, Father, I pray, Lord, that we trust you as well, trust you as a people, that we don't make rash decisions as leaders and as a community, Father. Lord, that we trust that your plan is to use that facility for your people to guide people that are hurt and lost and need hope from you. Only you will come to that place, Father. Or that we don't get caught up in our own problems and our own ways of doing things, Father. Lord, you, you guide us straight back, Father, to you. Praise you, your name. In Jesus' name, amen.